it's my pleasure now to welcome to the stage Professor Louis Salvador Carella. He's the head of the Centre for Mental Health Research at the Australian National University in Canberra. Professor Salvador Carrillo is committed to improving rural mental health care around the world by providing comparison tools that allow identifying the international benchmarks and the main gaps in the delivery system in rural areas. So please give him a warm Hobart welcome. Thank you very much and I hope uh, I can uh, uh, just focus on some of the issues that uh, have been mentioned right now. Uh, I, I would like first of all to acknowledge um, my colleagues working in this project that we call the Global Local Mental Health Atlas Project. We are mapping mental health services around the world and we are starting to get a better understanding of patterns and how um, comparison with uh, distant areas may uh, provide some organi organizational knowledge on how we arrange our care system. Um, there are more than uh, 100 people working in that, um, but I would like uh, especially to acknowledge Marian first, who is uh, leading the group on um, uh, the mapping of mental health here in Australia, Jose Alberto Salinas in Spain, who is doing the uh, coordination of uh, the health uh, geography and spatial analysis, John Mendoza from the company Connecticut, who is collecting um, most of the information we have got on, on rural areas, and uh, Petra Sontosta from Finland, uh, who has provided the data I will present today to compare uh, areas, remote areas in Australia and in, in Finland. So first of all, it's important uh, to uh, provide definitions of key terms that um, sometimes are used uh, not in the best way uh, as evidence, the difference between evidence-based and evidence-informed, the new area of healthcare context research. Then we will move to uh, provide a analysis of um, the healthcare context in uh, rural health and from there we will move to um, some uh, data on what evidence is telling us about our rural system and where next. First, um, uh, just a comment of what is the difference between scientific evidence and scientific expert knowledge. I was in a meeting in Sydney uh, three weeks ago and a decision maker, a, an important decision maker from one of uh, the states in Australia uh, said that um, uh, the evidence provided by the national mental health planning framework so and so. And um, I told her, well, this is not evidence, this is expert knowledge because it's gathered by consensus of experts more and based on data. And really scientific evidence is the part of scientific knowledge based on contextualized information from facts and data. This is it. The other, anything that is not that is not evidence. So we have another thing that is scientific expert knowledge. There is the set of formalized know-how, understanding, experience and insight in a defined, defined area of knowledge. This is another thing, but I am not saying that this is not important. As a matter of fact, um, one of the major differences of our current approach to scientific knowledge in regards to what was happening uh, uh, since the 1990 to um, uh, two years ago is, was that evidence-based um, uh, approaches considered that the expert knowledge should be not taken into account when we were doing that analysis. It was background information, expert opinion, something that we, we will not consider at all when we were gathering the information in our systematic reviews. Uh, there has been a major change in that and it comes from the fact of recognizing that uh, healthcare is a complex area and that comes from a seminar paper uh, uh, led by WHO in 2009, Systems Thinking. 
to also to recognize the importance of the context, that the only way we can understand implementation is not by the evidence provided here, is how we apply to this evidence in a specific locations. And these specific locations have characteristics, contextual characteristics that we have to know. And finally, uh, the issue of the American statistician, uh, the main journal on statistics in in United States uh, of this month, that is saying that we have to remove our reliance on the p-value. We have to move to complexity to understand expert knowledge, to understand context, and to understand statistical analysis in a different way. So what is happening now is that we are moving from the traditional pyramid of knowledge where we base our evidence-based approaches to try to understand as com things as complex as rural care to what I call the Greek temple, where uh, experimental knowledge is important, but just one column of other types of knowledge that are so important as this one, the observational knowledge, the expert knowledge, uh, and the, uh, the, sorry, the observational evidence, the context evidence, the expert knowledge, and the experiential knowledge of users and carers. What, we, what I am going to talk about today is about this context knowledge. What are the characteristics that frame a health intervention in one specific area, and particularly in rural health. And uh, this is also related to a new concept. Uh, we are moving away from evidence-based medicine to evidence-informed care. Evidence-informed care is different because it um, takes into account routine big data, local context, and uh, the expert knowledge to interpret, to provide meaning to this uh, highly complex information and to develop decision support systems. So as uh, WHO has uh, recently um, um, said in a, in a report published last year, evidence-informed rather than evidence-based uh, health policy acknowledges that policymaking is a political process in which research evidence, and that means research evidence from data, is only one factor that influences decision making. It has to compete with beliefs, personal interests, political considerations, traditions, past experience, and financial constraints. And we have to take into account all these components where we are analyzing implementation. Finally, a new concept is my area of research. I've been working in that for 20 years, but I didn't know how to call it. Uh, now we have a name and the name is Healthcare Ecosystems Research, and in a nutshell is to translate what has been developed and used for 30 years in environmental, environmental sciences to healthcare. This is a new discipline in implementation sciences that incorporates systems dynamics, context analysis, health economics, and knowledge discovery from data, these new types of statistics, um, uh, and uh, facilitates the analysis of the environment and the context and its knowledge translation to policy for decreasing research waste and to guide decision making. And context in healthcare includes all sources of evidence of local system, the geographical, the social, the demographic factors, other environmental factors, the service availability, the capacity of the system, the use of resources and the cost, and it also includes all the normative aspects and uh, the financing and funding aspects, as well as the history of the place. So this is uh, some critical concepts. What's happening in Australia? Well, uh, this was um, a statement by the Victorian Premier uh, uh, several months ago. We have a system that simply can't cope and will continue to contribute to tragedy. We are in the middle of a crisis of the mental health system, and uh, Australia doesn't show the capacity of uh, process and drive a change in a system that is not working. I have sometimes the feeling that we are in the Titanic, just uh, facing the iceberg and uh, not uh, knowing how to steer the boat away from it. As a matter of fact, we have four new inquiries 
um, the Productivity Commission, the Royal Commission in Victoria, uh, the Royal Commission into Aged Care that has incorporated mental health, the Senate inquiry into the accessibility and quality of mental health services in rural and remote Australia. And uh, unfortunately, this is not driven us out, uh, driving us out from, from the problems. And the problems, we know where they are and what they are. We had the TAMS uh, review of the uh, framework of strategic goals for 2015 to 2025. We have all the results of the Senate inquiry, inquiry and the forthcoming Orange Declaration of the Rural Mental Health Interest Group uh, that will be released in one month and that has been led by uh, Professor David Pake Perkins at the University of Newcastle. What we have in all these documents is uh, that there are major things that have to change in the system and we have to uh, underscore and highlight the role of professionals working in rural areas to develop integrated care systems, to look at the financing system, uh, to understand better the evidence, the data and how we can use them uh, to improve uh, our healthcare delivery. And in this area, what I have been working in with my colleagues at the Australian National University, University of Sydney and Connecticut, is the development of atlases of local mental health care in Australia. We have produced 20 atlases that are now comparing the situation and the patterns of care and the social and demographic factors in 13 uh, primary health networks including a series of uh, rural and remote networks in Western Australia and uh, um, New South Wales. Uh, this atlas provides information on the availability of uh, care provision. Uh, how many groups of clinical teams are working in the area? What types of activities are they providing? What is the variability of care in one area? how it relates to geospatial characteristics of social and demographic factors, how we can understand the types of care in relation to the target population, what is the balance of care between um, NGOs and uh, healthcare, what are the characteristics of the professionals working in all these settings. And uh, with this information, we are, have been able to provide for the first time a standard comparisons of the patterns of care related to uh, this number of care teams uh, uh, defined by the main activity, the more meaningful activity of why they, what they were doing per 100,000 population in urban areas and in rural er areas in Australia. And here is the comparison of country Western Australia and Western New South Wales in orange and this one in blue. What we see is that the pattern of care is different. That uh, the way care is organized in uh, country Western Australia is different than in Western New South Wales. And that these differences also apply when we are comparing neighboring areas. When we are comparing Western New South Wales and the far west LHDs, local health districts. When we compare the Kimberleys and P Kimberley and Pilbara when we make comparisons across rural areas that are neighboring, we again identify major difference in the way and the service availability, the placement capacity, uh, in where, where we, can, we have been able to look at that as well, the workforce capacity. So the problem, in my opinion, is not that much how we approach uh, the care provision in urban areas. The problem is how we understand an equity across different rural areas and how we identify benchmark areas and try to develop systems that allow us to understand the variability of our areas in comparison to the benchmark areas. Uh, and if we try, uh, we start or develop the comparison of the patterns of care in urban areas and here we have Canberra, Upper North, Western Sydney and Southeastern Sydney, but we have many more what we see is that the pattern of care provision related to care teams providing uh, residential community care, hospital care, alternatives to hospital, daycare, 
health outpatient care, social outpatient care, accessibility to care information and self-help provides a completely different pattern in urban areas than in rural areas. And that means that the idea that we can develop a single model of mental health care in Australia that would be, of course, developed in urban areas or for urban areas and apply it with some modifications to rural care will not work. We need a specific model of mental health care in rural areas starting from scratch and develop their own indicators and not trying to translate indicators developed in urban areas. And this also applied to drug and alcohol and to child and adolescents, where we see patterns of care very different to the patterns of care we identify in um, urban areas. But when we uh, make the comparison across uh, different local areas in Western Australia and in um, uh, Western New South Wales, we also identify uh, interest, interesting characteristics in the pattern of care provision, where there are differences in the number of uh, teams providing mobile care in the health sector, in the social sector, the capacity of providing daycare in the system. And uh, uh, the issue is that when we make this comparison and compare it to areas in, uh, in um, Europe, like in Norway or in, in the Pyrenees in Spain, we find some similarities in the characteristics of rural health that go beyond these models in Australia. The problem here is that uh, all these areas except for one are really remote areas, are areas where the population density per square kilometer is less than 1.5. Um, and, and when you try to compare it internationally, there are not so many places in OECD countries where you can find this remoteness that we have in Australia where we have a country of extremes. We are the, one of the most urbanized countries in the world, and, and at the same time, we are one of the most, uh, of the more uh, remote countries also in the world. And this requires special comparisons. Uh, one area that is very interesting is uh, the comparison of remote areas in Finland, in Lapland, where uh, they have a, a significant um, uh, uh, proportion of indigenous population and their level of population density is 1.4 near uh, the levels of population density we find in Western Australia, the far west and part of uh, Western New South Wales, we can develop another type of comparison. This is the pattern of care in um, Lapland and this is the pattern of care in, um, in Australia. Another thing that we can do is comparing the pattern of care of urban areas like Helsinki and the rural remote areas in um, Finland and then provide this same type of comparison in the case of uh, Australia. What we find when uh, we compare the patterns of care in Lapland and uh, uh, regional Western Australia is that there are major differences in the way the care provision um, is provided in the Lapland, in Finland, and in Western Australia. And it's very important to know what's happening. Where is the benchmark? Um, what are the indicators that are related to resource utilization and outcomes uh, that we have in Australia and we have in Lapland? But when we compare Lapland with uh, Western New South Wales, the pattern is different. It's very similar, particularly in, um, in the Western New South Wales local health district. So what we are having by making these types of comparisons is uh, identifying differences and similarities that will allow us to understand better uh, our local service provision. Now the question is, uh, what works better? Uh, taking into account that the patterns of care are similar. The, uh, model in Lapland or the model in the uh, Western New South Wales. And if the care provision pattern is so different in the Kimberleys and um, in mainly in Western Australia to the one in Lapland, what 
do these differences mean? What are the characteristics of the relationship between primary care and specialized care, the workforce capacity, the characteristics of resource utilization that may allow us to understand benchmark across uh, distant areas? And then, where next? Uh, we are starting to have the data, the real data, the evidence on service provision that may allow us to inform the development of a model of care in rural and remote Australia, as it has proposed in the Orange Declaration. We can analyze the equity of care, comparing what is happening in different rural areas and not trying to look at the urban areas. We can analyze the balance of care between the care provided by NGOs and the healthcare system, analyze properly the workforce capacity, and we have data in um, in uh, some areas in Australia, like in the far west, but we need more information there. It's easier for us to get the information on the workforce capacity in England, in New Zealand, or in Finland, or in France, that our capacity to get this information for making the analysis in Australia. And develop real world indicators in rural and remote areas that are related to the actual provision of care in these areas, modeling efficiency, and in relation to what has been said about the investment in millions of dollars in the system. Uh, from a complexity perspective, if you identify an inefficient system or a local inefficient system, the solution is not pouring money in this inefficient system because the only thing you will get is more inefficiency. The first thing is to understand how to move away from inefficiency in the care purpose care provision. And then, of course, understand this variability and where are the benchmarks. What we are doing now is working in an international global strategy that is called iCircle, that is trying to provide uh, the global standards for urban mental health care in the world. We have a conference in Washington in September uh, just to try to convince our colleagues in leadership uh, not only to focus in urban areas, but also to have a focus, a different focus on rural mental health care. Thank you very much.